My name is Dean. I'm a person in long-term recovery, and this is Inside Addiction. I want to welcome Kristen to the show today. Kristen, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. First things first, Kristen, I want to thank you for taking time out to your, your schedule um, to come and share Summer's story with us. Thank you for having me. Um, tell me about the last time that you talked to Summer. Well, it was an early morning ride on the way to work, and it was... Uh, I called her to talk to her about a sweater, and a uh, sweater that I wanted to get back from her. And it was the last conversation that I had with her, and I actually buried her in that sweater about six days later. And when was that? That was in 2015. Summer died on January 9th, 2015. So tell me about Summer, um, like school. Yes. I, I've looked at of pictures of Summer, and she just seemed so happy and full of life. And like she, I, I couldn't find a picture where she wasn't smiling. Right. Summer came out smiling. I think she was impish. She was full of life. She was fun. She was the life of the party. She was caring, sweet, challenging. She was the kind of girl that always had a little hand on her hips. Um, so from the beginning, that was her personality to, to push the limits a little bit. How was high school for, for Summer? High school uh, was fair for Summer. Um, she was well liked by her peers, um, but she would get into you know trouble from time to time. Um, uh, but high school overall was a relatively quiet period for her. Childhood? Childhood, not so much so. Um, when Summer was nine years old, uh, I started to see a change in her behavior. She went from being this really bubbly, friendly child to her second grade teacher was actually her first grade teacher and asked for her to come back and join her class. Mm. In fourth grade, I started to see that Summer's behavior changed. We'd be walking through the Grand Union and she'd be behind me kind of, you know, like swearing and just her, her clothes changed. She started dressing all in black, just wasn't her. Mm. And so I started to take her to counseling and during that period of time, um, it actually came out that she was a victim of child sexual hood abuse and life totally changed. You know, and in, in as a as a survivor myself in, in working with people with a substance use disorder, that's that's far too often a, a theme, some sort of trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and, and then you know, turning to self medicate. And you know, I never really, when you're dealing with something like that as a mother at that moment, you're mm. thinking about the now. You're almost too afraid to think of the future. And what I didn't realize and didn't even learn until a few years ago was that Summer began self-medicating right at that time. Wow. What she shared with me was that at nine years of age, she started drinking. Um, I didn't have it in my house, so I didn't think that she had access to it, but friends' houses. Um, and you know, it escalated from there. And I really, really wasn't even aware until at the age of 14, Summer came to me and said, you know, mom, I think that I have this problem. I've been smoking marijuana and I can't stop. At 14 years old? At 14 old. years of age. So, you know, we took her down. We took her to a program here in Schenectady. I can't even remember where it was. And, you know, Summer was so excited. She got her 30-day coin. Mm. She completed the outpatient. And we moved on. It seemed at that time that life was really was good you know summer moved into middle excuse me middle school and she had some trouble uh, summer had some trouble with uh, not being friendly not being outgoing but staying on task a um, lot of focus on the boys mm. and you know as quick as she would go it's always the boys <laughs> in trouble. <laughs> you know as quickly as she went into a special program actually in fifth and sixth grade for people who had been either through some type of trauma it was a new program that they were starting or okay. had some some problems at home um, but as quickly as summer would get involved in a program she might get kicked out of it for behavior issues as well at the same time. But very smart, academically very smart. She's probably one of the only children I know that managed to graduate from Gilderland High School in the last year, miss about 70 days. But and still she, she graduated in, in like 2000? 2000 or 2001, she graduated okay. right in that time frame. She played sports in school? She played sports when she was young. She okay. played soccer. Um, she wanted to work. Summer was highly motivated to work. She got her working papers at 14 years of age, talked herself into her first job, Dunkin' Donuts at the 20 Mile in Gilderland, and worked there and worked all the way through high school. Um, so it, for her, it was about being social, mm -hmm. having friends, and having money to shop, and she was willing to work to do that. And she started a family after she graduated. She so did. she became a mom. She became a mom. 
um, she called me at work and shocked me. Um, she actually said to me, I was in the middle of teaching a group of people uh, about their 401k, and she called me and said, Mom, you know that thing that happened to you when you were really young that you didn't want to have happen to me that you talked to me about? Well, guess what? It happened to me. You drove after a night. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but he was the best <coughs> blessing that has come into our lives. Um, Summer worked really, really, really hard to be a good mom. And uh, things were going well until I got a phone call. And, you know, I was sitting there in, the, in my house in Rotterdam, beautiful spring day. I can still remember the day when the phone rang. And a friend of Summer's, a very close friend, said, you know, you need to help Summer. Some of the heroin addict. And the floor, I mean, I had, you know, wheat pot, things like that. Sure. You know, I, and I had no clue. And my world and Summer's world just changed. And the hell that I think, you know, I call addiction a hell when you're an active addiction that's known to somebody using in their family, it started and it became for us a 12 year roller coaster. So, addiction, if you look at um, family history, your father as well? Yes. Um, I say, I kind of jokingly say, you know, shake my family tree and the alcoholics and the addicts will come rolling out. Um, my father, uh, as I grew up, he was an active alcoholic. And I found out a few years ago that my grandfather, who I had never met, died at 36 years of age. Wow. And uh, he died. I saw his death certificate. It was cirrhosis and, and chronic alcoholism. At 36 at years 36 old? 36 years of age. So every child, myself, my two sisters, we each have a child who struggles with either alcohol or addiction. I have a nephew right now who's in treatment, but if somebody wanted to use the words that you might use, he'd be considered the town drunk at 40 hmm. years of age, living at times in the woods um, with the homeless people, himself being homeless. Um, this was a kid at 14 who was an Eagle Scout, straight hmm. student. Um, and my other sister, out of her seven children, she has uh, a child who struggled with meth um, and had gotten herself clean. Things were going well, and now she's actively on the streets using heroin, and she's about 29. So definitely genetics, family history, it's all there. So at some point, Summer goes to the hospital, gets into treatment. It became, well, that day, when she called me, the very first step that happened is she had a son. And I had to make the difficult decision to go to court the very next day and do wow. an emergency removal of Richie from the home. Um, and Summer, for a two-year period, kind of just was in and out of Richie's life. Um, when she was doing well, she'd be at our house visiting. Um, we'd have periods of clean time, periods of not so clean time. Um, and then it really, really uh, started to escalate. Um, until about, I would say 2007, it just really, we started to bottom out during that time frame. So she ends up going into Columbia Memorial Hospital in 2007, yeah. and she actually kept a journal yes. that you've, you've brought today. Yes. So we have the opportunity to, to really look into her mindset, where she was, I think. At that, at that time. You know, and it's ironic because I didn't find this until after Summer died. Wow. And so these, although the words can be difficult, they helped me understand where she was at. So Would I'll you? share a few of those. Thank you. Yeah. So this is from September 2007. Today was one of the most difficult days of my life. I'm not sure what to do or even say. I'm so depressed, lonely, and lost. I've let everyone who loves me down, just like I've always done. But this time, it's much worse. I actually tried to kill myself. Not just for attention, but to die. What was I thinking? I have a wonderful little boy. I brought him into this world, and he needs me. Who else's job is it to take care of him? I mean, really. Of course, there are others that do, and will always be willing, but it's my job. No matter what's going on in my life, I need to get it together, if not for myself, but then for him. I'm sick and tired of this lifestyle. Yes, it's fun at times, and it feels good, but for what? An hour, maybe two? Why jeopardize my life, my family, and my future for a high? It sounds so stupid, but it's not that easy to do. Today I learned that you can't trust people that you think you can. 
most people are really only in it for themselves. And then this is a couple days later. Well, she actually ended saying, I'm just going to take care of this one day at a time and hmm. never give up. And a couple days later, she says, my mom came today. We had a wonderful visit. I miss that. I miss the old days. I'm not sure if we could ever get them back, but I'm hoping that we can. We used to be so close. My brother, I miss him. Now he's so very distant. I'm not sure what to do. Everything is happening so fast. Do I go back to rehab for the fourth time, which never works? It only gets me more connects or a shelter. Or do I go to Kevin's? No one who knows both of us wants us to be together. I don't think our relationship is healthy. I need someone who will love me no matter what, who won't judge me or call the cops or my family on me, work with me, grow with me, and love me. Why can't I find that? I need someone who will work with me and he will love me unconditionally and I will love him. Please God, give me that. I'm trying so hard, help me out and forgive me of all my wrongdoings. I'm better than that and I know that. On that note, good night. Thank you for sharing that. You're welcome. So, Tell me about the time and, you know, the, the years that followed that journal. You know, Summer tried so hard. We had years where she actively sought recovery, mm. and we would have amazing times as a family. You know, she would be together with her brother. Uh, we would be together with her children. We would have wonderful opportunities to enjoy each other. And then there would be periods of time where it was too much for her. She would go to rehab. She would, I would say, go down and then she would surface. And when she would surface, we would have more amazing family times. So at one point, you wrote a letter to a judge. I did. I did. This was uh, during that time frame when Summer came out of uh, this period. She spent actually three weeks in a psychiatric unit during that period. And uh, when she came out, she was trying, um, but she ended up living on the street. In Hudson and it was probably the worst time of her life and I wrote a letter to a judge begging him to please either you know I wanted him to send her to jail and then to a treatment facility because that was my thought process that at least that's perhaps a way that we can save her life um, and you know it was during that time frame that we actually worked with the district attorney and she was the first person who actually saw Summer as a person who had a disease and hmm. didn't, you know, judge her and say, this is a moral failing, um, and really started to give our family a glimmer of hope, and Summer. And so Summer actively started to, you know, it was like a slippery slope, I call it, a few steps forward, a few steps sure. back, sometimes a big plunge downhill. The progress, not perfection. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So after that, um, there were seven years of her life where she was living in recovery. She actually had more children. She did. She had met, she met an amazing man who was in recovery himself, um, and they had two children together, two young boys. And Summer, you know, I, I came to realize that it was really the disease of addiction for Summer, that she didn't love her children any less, mm. but it was actually that the disease would take over. And, and you know, if I can, it, that's such a hard thing for people that don't understand this disease is like, how could someone do this that has kids you know I've, I've seen on social media for some reason you know people have decided to start taking pictures and posting you know pictures of parents you know um overdose in a car with the kids in the back seat and i tell people like it, it, it's like telling somebody to stop having cancer addiction doesn't stop because you have your kids 100 percent. you know and, and it's when you can truly recognize it's a it's a disease and I struggled. You know, you struggle as a grandmother of these children. Sure. You know, I'm a nurse, so that helps me a little bit to understand it. Um, but you still come at it from a very human, human way. Sure. And seeing Summer, though, when she was free from the throes of addiction mm. and how she loved those children, you know, it, it made me understand. It made me understand that it truly was a disease that, that took over during those periods. And Summer herself, one of her major relapses was with her children in a car. A very traumatic event. So tell me about 
the fall of 2012. She was doing well. Um, she was doing very well, and um, during that period, um, she had a relapse. So she had the relapse in, in 2012, um, and she relapsed on crack, crack at that cocaine, point? Yes, what had happened during that period, she actually relapsed with the crack, and she ran into her drug dealer, and he had uh, thought that she had been ratting him out mm. because she had been clean for such a period of time. She was doing well. She had a house in Scotia. She actually had her children back in her life, and she relapsed, and he pushed her down the stairs, and uh, when she came home to her home that day, Three flights of stairs. Three flights of stairs, actually, yes. Ripped her leg open apart. She came home to her house, and she heard a knocking on the door. And she was so paranoid because she thought the person who was knocking was the drug dealer coming after her. So she actually ran out of her house, ran through the front door of another apartment, busted it open, and then ran through the plate glass window that was there, um, almost losing her life. Um, and that was the crime that she was convicted of, um, damaging other people's property, criminal mischief, that led her to the door of making the choice to work with Schenectady Drug Court. And, you know, that decision for Summer, we had a lot of conversations about that decision. And she knew it would be hard. She mm. knew that this isn't going to be the easiest road for me. You know, she could just serve her time. Sure. And this is what she'd done many times before. Tr treatment's not easy. No. This was going to be a hard choice. And she said to me, you know, I don't want to live in this hell of addiction anymore. Mm. And I actually have a prayer, if I may share it with you. Absolutely. That she wrote during that time frame. She wrote the prayer in jail. She wrote the prayer in jail. Dear God, I really need your strength in overcoming my addiction. This craving has become a dominant force in my life. I need your love to unchain me from this prison I've created. Please surround me with your love and guidance to help me fight this great temptation. Give me the strength so that I can win this battle. I know with you everything is possible. I so need your love and support. Amen. Hmm. She wanted to be sober. Summer didn't want to be an addict. She said to me, you know, Mom, I was an addict before I even knew I was when she picked up that first drug. So I had never been more proud of her than when she selected to go to Schenectady Drug Court. It gave us back an amazing year um, that we had in our life. You know, we came up to Christmas time, and three years before that, we had celebrated Christmas while Summer was in prison. Mm. We couldn't even see her um, on Christmas Day. The year before, she was in treatment, and we were able to visit her. And this year, she was with us in our home. We were celebrating. Christmas the way it should be. The way it should be you know, happy as a family together. And for Summer, she was giving that year. She wasn't just taking, she had gifts for everybody. She was so proud of herself. And she promised me, you know, Mom, I'm, I'm gonna give you peace this year. So at one point, Summer was a resident in the YWCA housing program? Yes, she was. Um, Summer had semi-completed. <laughs> if anybody knows what I'm talking about, who's been in and out of treatment, uh, she was discharged to the area. And uh, she was living in a local homeless type of shelter mm -hmm. here. And she herself moved in and did all the things that she needed to do and to be accepted into the women's housing program. And uh, that fall, I was so excited because she came to me and she shared information with me and told me she was going to run this run. And I was like, Summer, we don't run anywhere, like except across the room for a cookie, you know. And she was just so... Um, committed and dedicated that she did the practice. I watched her do all of this. And on December 5th of 2014, she crossed the finish line um, of the Jingle Bell Run. I think we have a, we have yeah, a picture of her picture. at that race, yep. uh, crossing yep. the, the finish line of the Jingle Bell Run. Yes. Um, you know, I've been proud of Summer every day of her life, every day of her life. But this day was above the, above the rest, you know. Yeah, she's just my beautiful daughter. I was standing there and she would say to me, Mom, you really don't need to come, you know. Um, <laughs> and I knew that that was her way of saying, you know, come watch me. And she ran every step of the way and she did it in honor of her grandmother. It was a run for arthritis and it was just a, it was thrilling to see her cross the finish line. So December 2014, you guys yeah. celebrated your Christmas together we had right after that run 
you know, we had an amazing couple weeks. It was just like everything was wonderful. Mm. And there was this beautiful snowy night that we had together. Um, it was in 2014, around mm -hmm. December 13th. It was a night in Troy. And if anybody knows anything about Troy, it's just that beautiful picturesque city that looks like a Victorian Christmas. Yeah. Snow was falling, it was amazingly beautiful. And we celebrated uh, by going out to a concert together and it was just this beautiful, beautiful snowy day. Um, but I do have words to share with you about a snowy day about three weeks later. A 31-year-old female with a history of mental disorders found dead by Schenectady police. The body is identified by the attached name tag and is received in a blue bag with a seal bearing the number 009591 attached to the bag. The body is clothed in a red long sleeve t-shirt and blue pants. Multiple tattoo marks are found to be present on the surface of the body. On the right foot is the word Richie and Anthony, tattooed on top of a butterfly. On the left foot, the word Caden is tattooed. And these are the children's names. And on the right breast area, the words to thine own is tattooed. On the left breast area, self be true is tattooed. Our life changed for forever that day. Um, you were actually planning to go to church. Yes. That Sunday. That Sunday. Summer was supposed to come to church with me. And uh, instead, I ended up there. I didn't know where else to be. That's where I needed to be. Mm. And my son, Summer's brother, was with me. We were holding on to each other, just weeping. Mm. And um, they read some words that service was about being free hmm. and the irony just I'm, I'm standing there and, and they they showed a, the analogy that they used on the media display was a little girl carrying this turtle in a box down to the side of the river and she kept trying to tell the turtle you know go go be free go into the water and every time the turtle would go out he would turn around and come back into the box and they read words from Romans that day I think that you might have them yeah, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And those words really, really resonated with me that day. And I thought, oh, how I wish she was here to hear this. Um, because they resonated and seemed to fit, those were the words that we used at Summer's funeral. And ironically enough, when I found her Bible, one night when I was really, really struggling a few weeks later and praying, I went down through a box and there was Summer's Bible. And as I was going through it, um, in the front she had written that she accepted the Lord as her savior, that she asked for forgiveness of her sins, that she knew with him she would have a grand and glorious future, which comforted me. Because I said, you will, baby girl. It's just not here and now. Mm. And when I paged through it, those same words were underlined in red in Romans. What is it that people don't know about the disease of addiction that you think they should? I think first and foremost that it's a disease. It's not a choice. That so many people who struggle with addiction have something in their past um, so many people, 70-80%, some form of trauma. And that, you know, just stepping back and being judgmental isn't going to do anything. And that, yes, we have this disease of addiction, but we have the hope of recovery. Mm. And that's what gets me through, that if there's anything that I can do in sharing Summer's story to say that, yes, this is one outcome. This is the real reality. Pick up heroin, pick up a drug, pick up, it doesn't matter because if it's not one drug, ironically, Summer had conquered opiates and heroin. She died from an overdose of other drugs mm. that somebody would think is relatively okay. But combined with her regular meds, it was more than her body could sustain and it took her away from us. So that understanding several things, one, that one drug isn't any better or worse than any other, that 
Right now we're in a heroin epidemic, pandemic. 20 years ago, we were in a crack cocaine epidemic. Addiction always was, it always will be. And if we don't come to long-term solutions to support recovery, we're gonna be where we are now. The great thing that I'm feeling thankful and hopeful about is that we're finally recognizing this as a disease. The Surgeon General's report that just came out. People learning to say not, you know, I'm clean now and why were you dirty before? Just this new language yeah. that we're having, yeah. you know? And so I wish Summer was here to see this. It, to me, it's like a recovery revolution and it's gonna be amazing, you know? And so that's why I share Summer's story. So you've developed kind of an event that takes mm -hmm. place um, on a Saturday mm -hmm. in every May, mm -hmm. Um, which I just think is great when, when I look back at that picture of the race that, that she ran. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the, the Summersmith 5K. Yes. The run came about because of the feeling that I had when I watched Summer cross that finish line. I'm like, if Summer can do it, Mom can do it. So Summer and I were actually supposed to train together um, that spring to run a race. And so I ran with the women. Um, it's a group called STEM, Strong Through Every Mile, that had mentored Summer. They typically in this area work with women who live in uh, housing that has to do with domestic violence. Mm -hmm. and the goal is to empower women through running. And so I ran and I got through my grief. And our goal run that year was a run that a mother had put on that's been happening for about 10 years. She lost her daughter, um, she was murdered by uh, her husband or her partner wow. um, due to domestic violence. And as I'm running, I'm starting to think, and that's how my mind works, I wonder if there's anything like this in this area for addiction. And I started to research and there wasn't. And I started to talk to my friends and say, hmm, I wonder if I could do this. And they said, you're not wondering, you're doing it. And I gathered some of those amazing women from STEM, some people from drug court, just a great group of people, became a race director and put together the first annual Summer Smith 5K. And I love the motto is, is run the race, stop the stigma. Yeah. You know, and it's what I started with because Summer could never see herself for the truly beautiful soul that she was. Mm. You know, you mentioned earlier all the smiles on her face, how beautiful. Summer was a beautiful girl. Absolutely. But she couldn't see it. Summer worried about the outside so much, and her grandmother used to say to her, Summer, it's what's on the inside. But because Summer never really healed from the trauma, she didn't like who she was on the inside. Um, and so we need to have this conversation. We need to stop the stigma. We need to be able to say it's okay to talk about our trauma or talk about our issues or, or why we're doing what we're doing. And so that was where it started, was that, that phrase. And it's every May. It's every May. On a Saturday. And you're gonna be there. I oh every May on a she Saturday. Got me to, <laughs> you cornered me on camera. <laughs> yes, I wow. did. Wow, I will be there. Um, thank you for for sharing Summer's story today. You are You're truly a champion um, in the recovery efforts. Thank you. Until next time, take it one day at a time, and remember, denial only works for a while.